So I'm very excited to be able to introduce Susan, especially as someone who does research in the area of computer architecture and compilers. Um, so Susan is a professor emerita of computer science and engineering, and she joined the department here at UW in 1989 after receiving her PhD from UC Berkeley. Um, her research interests are in computer architecture and backend compiler optimization. With her colleague Hank Levy and their students, she developed the first commercially viable multi-threaded architecture, simultaneous multi-threading, which was adopted by Intel, IBM, Sun, and others, and won the 2010 and 2011 ISCA Test of Time Award. In 1989, Professor Eggers was awarded an IBM Faculty Development Award in 1990, an NSF Presidential Young Investigator Award. In 1994, the Microsoft Professorship in Computer Science and Engineering, and in 2009, the ACMW Athena Lecturer. She is a fellow of the ACM and IEEE, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2018, she was awarded the Eckert Mockley Award for her work on simultaneous multi-threading. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, the Eckert Mockley Award is considered to be the most prestigious award in the computer architecture community, and Susan was the first woman to win the award in its more than 40-year history. Um, prof today, Professor Eggers approaches her free time with a vengeance. Uh, she's a bona fide food snob, an avid gardener, and landscaper, uh, which you'll get to hear more about during her talk now. And so with that, uh, Susan is open to questions during her talk and afterwards. Um, so feel free to ask questions through the chat if you have them during the talk and I'll do my best to ask them as they come in. All right, so Susan, uh, feel free to go ahead. I am here, just start talking. Yeah, we can hear you. I, I see you on my screen, but I usually see me. There uh, we go, yeah. okay, hi. Uh, let me, okay. So, um, hi everyone, it's really nice to be here. Uh, back in the department, kind of back in the department. Uh, it's been a while for me. I retired uh, almost a decade ago, um, and that was the end of computer science for me. It was time to go on smelling other roses, and uh, literally, as it turned out, and you'll hear that at the end of my talk. Uh, so what I'm, uh, my remarks today, what I'm gonna do today is to talk, give you a, a talk that is based upon my acceptance speech when I got the Eckerd Mockley Award. Um, most people, when they get an award of this sort, they give a technical talk or they give a retrospective of their whole career. And I, I really didn't want to do that. I mean, 10 years is a long time to be away from the field. And actually, almost you know, everyone in the room already knew the technology behind uh, why I won the award. So I gave a rather personal talk, and that's what I'll do today with you. So I'd like you to know like, how I thanked the Eckerd Mockley Committee for honoring me. Um, a few words about um, a key collaborator uh, through my whole career. Um, I had an unusual pathway to academics, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then a few technical words about simultaneous multi-threading. Uh, but sort of from the 25,000 view of it, not any of the details. And then I'd like to do what I did actually at the conference. This was at the International Symposium of Computer Architecture. It's one of the main conferences in computer architecture. I talked to the women in the audience. As it turned out, there was a record number of female architects at that conference, 25%. That was huge. That is huge. When I first began, it was more like you know, three or two or even one percent of attendance by women. Uh, and so I'll sort of pass on to you the same advice that, that I gave to them. Uh, but first, let's begin with the Eckerd Mockley Award. So um, my thanks to the Eckerd Mockley Committee was not the usual, oh, thank you so much for giving me this award. I, I wanted it to be much more encompassing. Um, I thank them instead, not yet, not yet. It's not time for the SMT slides. Thank you, all right, <laughs> I'll maybe tell you. Um, I wanted to thank them instead for breaking another professional glass ceiling. 
I mean, as, as was said in the introduction, I was the first woman to win this award, not in its more than 40 year history, in its 59 year history. And um, it's not that there weren't other, that there aren't other women deserving. You know, in my view, there is a backlog of women that should really get the award. But it was important to me to have everybody recognize that the work of a female architect was now, in fact, being recognized. Um, I, I didn't say, in fact, and now, I didn't say finally being recognized, but I have, I have a feeling uh, that that was kind of implied in what I said. Um, I also wanted to point out and sort of, um, now you can do it, the SMT researchers, the slideshow, I also wanted to point out the researchers who participated in making SMT, simultaneous multi-threading, a success. And the biggest thanks goes, of course, to someone you already know, or you will know soon, and that's Hank Levy, um, who, who was the longtime chair of our department and was the first director of the Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering right, right before Magda. Uh, Hank was my longtime collaborator. I mean, and not just on SMT, on um, other projects as well. We had what I would call a remarkably um, smooth uh, and compatible collaboration. We had different technical skills. I mean, he, he, was, he was, I think, better on the conceptual side, I on the experimental side. He overlapped with operating systems. I overlapped with um, compiler optimization and code generation. But we had what what he called uh, the same research values. And examples of that were, we never published before the work was ready for prime time. We spent an inordinate amount of time on the last 5%, you know, making it perfect. Uh, and this was whether it was developing an idea or a talk or a paper or, or mentoring students. Um, we never argued, there he is. A few years ago, there he is with brown hair, we never argued uh, and we always had fun. We were friends and, and we still are friends. And, and in the end, we published about a dozen papers on SMT, uh, not just the architecture, but the microarchitecture with OS, compilers, parallel processing, I mean, the whole gamut. Uh, I, also, I also think that it is true that the general course of my career or in the success in my career um, would not have been possible if I had not landed in this department. I mean, from its very beginning, uh, CSE at UW uh, believed in, practiced, and rewarded, that's important, rewarded collaboration in both teaching and research. Uh, it, before it became sort of au courant, and also clearly before now when it's necessary because the field is so complicated and all the different subfields interact, uh, you get much more mileage when you collaboration, when you collaborate. And, and you dubbed did that from the very beginning. I do not believe that if I had been in a department where there were silos, you know, faculty fiefdoms, where faculty only worked with their own students, they didn't have seminars together, they didn't really talk to each other, other that I actually would not have even gotten tenure. You know, and that's a big difference between not getting tenure and where I was when I retired. Uh, I was fortunate to be here and, and uh, so are you, in fact. Um, I had a bit of a circuitous route to becoming a researcher in computer architecture. Out of college, this is 1965, uh, I began working as a secretary in the economics department of Yale. And one day my boss asked me if I would write a program that would multiply matrices. Okay, you must be absolutely stunned at this. But back in that day, multiplying a matrix was an entire computer program that you typed out on these little punched cards and submitted to somebody who was behind a glass wall to a computer that was the size of a barn. Um, so I bought a book on Fortran. I read it over the weekend and I was absolutely transformed. Turns out that computer programming is intellectually uh, very much like um, uh, uh, devising an offensive strategy in bridge, um, 
And so I stopped playing bridge. I stopped being a secretary and I started computer programming. You can, you can get rid of Hank now and uh, put me on the big screen and I'll tell you when to play the next slide. Great, okay, all right. Um, about the same time, I became involved in the nascent women's movement, and which gave me a really different mindset on what a woman could think and what a woman could do with her life. And, and this was important. Um, I was raised in the 50s, when little girls were taught repeatedly to be seen and not heard. And I was having a hard time doing it, in fact. Many, many, many steps later, I took a job, this is before graduate school, I took a job at Lawrence Berkeley Labs uh, in a database research group. Uh, my first day on the job, I was expecting my boss to you know, give me an orientation of sorts. And, he, and instead he said, uh, and this is all he said, pick a problem, look around, pick a problem and work on it. You know, I, I was a novice application programmer. I really thought, you know, what on earth is a problem? But I did look around. Most of the people were working on statistical databases, which are largely zeros, like 85% or so. Wasteful, I thought. And so I devised a compression algorithm that got rid of those zeros, but left hooks in there so that you could get them back if you actually wanted to do something with the data, like compute on it, not just store it. I published uh, that work in two papers in um, one of the top uh, database conferences. Uh, uh, Magda, this is VLDB. And I suspect uh, that that was my ticket into graduate school at Berkeley. Um, I was, and also at the beginning of my architectural career. I was at the time almost 40 years old. And I think after that, my career was more normal, but the beginning was a little different. Um, let's now talk a little bit about simultaneous multi-threading. And I, here I'm speaking from my own viewpoint. I mean, a lot of time has passed and by now all of us have a slightly uh, different view of what happened and we have different stories to tell. Um, I'll try to do this in a way that minimizes the technical jargon because I realize that most of you, or in fact, maybe all, none of you have had a course in advanced computer architecture, which is kind of where this falls. Uh, so if I say something you don't understand, um, just stop me, stop me by chatting. Um, uh, excuse me, SMT, simultaneous multi-threading or SMT is an out of order processor. Oh wait, <laughs> already, okay. An out of order processor is a CPU that will execute instructions, not necessarily in the order in which the program that the programmer writes presents to the machine. It can execute them in some other order, and it does this because it thinks it's going to be more efficient. You'll get more instruction throughput in some way if it does that. So uh, SMT was one of these machines. It was an out-of-order processor that would execute multiple instructions, not from a single thread, but from multiple threads at the same time. I mean, literally in the, in the same cycle. And this eliminates both hardware and software context switching between threads. Okay, so normally on a multi-threaded processor, you would execute a bunch of instructions from thread one, you would switch, switch, switch to thread two, maybe back to thread one or on to thread three or whatever. So this is a machine that would execute instructions from all of those threads exactly at the same time. Um, this eliminating these context switches um, allowed SMT to convert what we call thread level parallelism, meaning executing multiple threads in parallel, and that's kind of a coarser grain of parallelism, into instruction level parallelism, a much finer grain. It's at executing instructions at the same time. And the, this is the level on which the processor actually operates. The actual hardware does this, uh, can deal with this. Okay, this provided a huge, boost to performance improvement, measured not in percentages, but in X. So we, we often, in computer architecture, we often publish papers that will show that the new design that we have devised brings a 15 or 25% performance improvement. And here was a machine that was not, not doing that. It was improving performance by 
1.5 to even up to four times what had normally been achieved. Um, and it did this without really unduly inhibiting uh, the progress of individual threats. So this was one of SMT, you know, the, the, this converting of thread level parallelism into, structure, in, into instruction level parallelism kind of seamlessly in hardware that was already used for out of order execution was one of the reasons that SMT got the performance it does. And I'll, I'll mention the other one in a moment. Okay, so how did SMT do this? Well, there were a couple of techniques, but I think the main one was an instruction fetch algorithm that was called iCount. What iCount did was it fetched instructions from uh, in the instruction queue uh, from the thread that had the fewest instructions there. In other words, it was fetching instructions from the thread that was presumably making the best th progress through the machine at that point in time. This was particularly important. This was 1994 because at that time, the major paradigm was one thread executing all by itself. There was hardly any multi-threading at the time. And so you wanted to, um, sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit. So back to iCount board. It, it did not care um, why these instructions were making good progress. It didn't care why other instructions were blocked. It just picked the one that was making the best progress. Okay. The second source of performance benefit was that almost all of the hardware resources, um, both the hardware data structures and the logic were shared across all the threads. Um, this is something that commercial implementations of SMT didn't do, or, or they didn't do to the same extent. And it was particularly important when there was a thread that was executing all by itself, which again was that paradigm being 1994. Um, it brings the same performance benefit that say a unified cache of instructions and data gives you. If you have a very tight loop, hardly any instructions, but a huge amount of scientific data, all the data can fill the cache. And the same thing is true when it works the other way around. So here was a situation where even if you were only executing one thread, that thread could be a hog for the, all of, our, of, of the hardware. And uh, typically, in multi-threaded machines, that was not the case. Each thread had its own hardware, and it was separate from the others. So that was the second reason that SMT got uh, the good performance. Our, our original motivation for SMT stemmed from a series of performance studies that we did to try to figure out why superscalers, meaning in order or out of order machines that would execute multiple instructions, um, we're not getting better performance. And you could have an eight wide superscalar and would it give you eight times the performance? No, it would give you 1.75 or something really low like that. And what we found that there was that there was no single cause of performance degradation, that you were just kind of being nickeled and dimed all over the place. And in fact, if you, if you fixed the bottleneck in one component, that bottleneck just shifted someplace else and you were hardly, hardly any better. So uh, what this said to us was that you could not solve this problem with a collection of component specific designs, that you had to think much more general. You needed a general solution. And for us, that meant threads. Uh, we, we also realized that in order to have impact with this idea, that we had to show that it was implementable. So at the time, around 94 or 95, you know, this was, the microprocessor industry was just transitioning from in-order processors, one instruction at a time, executed in program-generated order, to out-of-order processors that could execute um, multiple instructions at the same time, superscalers, in other words. And we thought it was a bit of a stretch to get them to accept that this out of order hardware would also let you execute instructions from multiple threads almost seamlessly. You know, hardly had to make any hardware changes at all. And so for that reason, we um, decided to ask architects 
from digital equipment. So this would be people who didn't just devise architectural ideas, they actually built hardware and sold it, if they wanted to join our project. And they did. Um, and so, and they joined us, not for the original paper where the ideas were proposed, but on the second one, which dealt with the implementation. And um, the architects at Intel, after that was published, the architects at Intel really, really took notice. And what they noticed, other than, of course, the content of the paper, was the fact that digital architects from digital were in the um, author list. Okay, and they thought, like, what is digital equipment doing on a UW SMT project? Could digital possibly be building this machine? Well, yes. Uh, and so that was the beginning of their hyper-threading effort, which was the name they gave to the SMT processor that they built and sold. Um, or at least that's the story as told to me by a designer who was there at the time. Let me give that caveat. Uh, digital did build SMT, and they demonstrated that the actual hardware got the same performance benefits that I told you before on, on our simulator and also on digital simulator, they, they more or less matched. Um, and that it came with very little additional hardware costs, only 15%. So for 15% cost in hardware, you're getting 1.5, 2, 3, 4, 4 X in performance improvement. It was called the Alpha EV8, the 21464, or uh, at least it would have been. Um, but just as the, the 21464 was about to go into production, Intel bought the technology from digital and they killed it basically. They chose uh, their own processors based on the x86 instruction set. That was a major, major professional heartbreak for us. You know, we had worked so hard we had showed that it got huge performance benefit. We had showed that the hardware cost was very little and it just sort of disappeared, you know, in a day. It happens. Um, lastly, I think uh, I'd like to share with you something that really helped me in my research and, and teaching career. Uh, very early on, when I was a graduate student, I realized that I was not very good at thinking on the fly. And so I began devising, um, you know, thinking ahead and planning for what I would say when uh, people asked me about my research or about any of the issues, you know, in our computer architecture of the day. These are known as elevator talks now. And I had a bazillion elevator talks. And I also have numerous stories of how they benefited me through my career. And I'd like to tell you one. So one day, an IBM researcher uh, visit, named John Cock visited Berkeley. And one of my advisors, Dave Patterson, invited some of his students, to have, including me, uh, to have lunch with him. Okay, we were like totally intimidated. You know, this was John Cock, Turing Award winner. Turing Award is, you might know, is the highest honor in computer science given to someone in, in any field. So he had won the Turing Award for his um, really pathbreaking work in compiler optimization and the designs that he did and the pathway to um, an architecture that would eventually be called RISC. So uh, being the Southern gentleman that he was, he eventually asked each of us in turn what we were working on. Uh, the first student said, I'm in systems. That's it. The second student said, I do what he does. And when it came around to me, I rolled out one of my elevator talks and I said to him what the problem I was working on, it was cache coherence at the time, why it was an important problem, what the thrust of my solution was, and how my solution was different from the rest of the pack. Okay. All right, so we're walking out of the restaurant, the students all in front and John and, and Dave are in the back and I can hear him saying, who's that girl in systems? Okay, not exactly politically correct. Remember I was, I'm in my forties, girl, okay. And had the wrong area, but he had noticed. 
And soon after, I found myself with an IBM fellowship that paid for three years of graduate school. When I interviewed, I had more job offers than any woman had had in the history of IBM. And when I eventually chose academia over industry, IBM supported my compiler research for three years. John Cock was behind all of that. Bless his heart. Okay, so, so what's the message here? Uh, actually, actually, the two messages. Try to figure out what you're good at and what you're not good at, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, and find a way to compensate for the latter. And the second message is to get a mentor, or actually get lots of mentors. You know, they, they really, really will not let you down. All right, so um, one last thought with you. Uh, I'm no longer a computer architect, I'm retired, uh, but I still haven't given up architecture. So um, I have, um, uh, what you see on the screen now are pictures of a result of a new in retirement career, landscape architecture. So I have turned uh, a little shy of half acre of a backyard from um, blackberry bramble, horsetails, and a bog into what is really a, a kind of a lovely little garden with, um, you know, lots of perennials, small trees, and shrubs with um, stone paths moving upwards and a stream coming downwards. I love it, actually. Uh, and I will say retirement is, is pretty great, too. So, so that's it. I want to thank you for inviting me. It was really great to be talking to you, and I wish you the best of luck on your careers. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat now. Um, otherwise, Susan, I had a question for you, okay. uh, which was um, computer architecture always has been and still kind of is a sub area that really doesn't have many women. So I was wondering how you ended up in computer architecture and if you had any advice um, beyond uh, what you already gave us on how to uh, succeed and do well in a sub area where women are so underrepresented. Okay, uh, it, there, was, there was in fact um, a pivotal point. You remember I was in this database group at Lawrence Berkeley Lab you know, learning about um, how, how you manage databases and software. And I ran across a paper where someone had built hardware that did all of the basic um, operations of database in the hardware. And it was of course, and I was just like, wow, this is great. And that, that sort of did it. I changed immediately from software <laughs> to hardware. And it was that simple. And it didn't, you know, I was already in an environment in the department where there were hardly any women and there were hardly any women on the faculty. So being in our computer architecture where there were hardly any women was kind of more of the same. Got it. Um, well, I think uh, I don't see any questions. So thank you again, Susan. Uh, You're welcome. It was great to have you. Nice or, to oh, you. sorry. Here is thank a you, question. Susan. Oh, and I, I, I need to go have another conference call now, but Susan, so nice to see you. Nice to see you too, Magda. Bye. Bye, everyone. So nice to see everyone today. I see it. How did you find your mentors? Oh, yep. Uh, how did I find my mentors? Some of them were, I mean, it, it always involved some input on my part and my, on my part. So with John Cock, I mean, it might have looked like if he just like blew in from the sky, you know, but in fact, I had prepared. Remember those elevator talks? I was all set to talk to him when we had lunch. And, and I did the same thing with funders. Like um, uh, in, when we would go to conferences, um, representatives from funding agencies that were not National Science Foundation, which of course all grant proposals are reviewed there, but these were agencies like the Defense Department or the Energy Department and the program managers actually made the decisions themselves. So I would arrange to have a meeting with the program manager. I would begin by giving him my 30 second summary of maybe five different projects. 
he would say, okay, tell me more about two and five. And I would roll out the two minute version of two and five. He would say, all right, send me a proposal on two. And you know, there was money in three months. I mean, at NSF, it could take a year. So part of that, part of finding these mentors was always being prepared in that way. And the reason I did that is that I knew I just had a hard time, you know, just like talking on my feet. Um, sometimes I was more deliberate. So I said, uh, let me make the, two more things. Okay. I said to someone, you know, big, a big cheese in computer architecture at an important school. I caught him on the escalator and I said, you know, I, I have this feeling that you're one of my letter writers. And if that is the case, I'd like to keep you. And he said, not denying the situation at all, he said, you can do that by sending me every paper that you publish. You know, every paper that you write. This is in the days we're not like trading papers because they're online, we're giving them physical paper copies, okay? And so I did that the whole time and he stayed with me. I mean, he stayed with me from the tenure letter through the National Academy of Engineering. You know, you can see I tend to be kind of deliberate on this. You know, I, I will say that there are other ways of doing this. I, I at the CRAW workshop um, for women, uh, this is a workshop that where women uh, give their experience and, and talk to you about how you teach, how you write a grant, how you do re write a paper, how you do research, how you manage home life when you have such a busy, busy job, how you network and so forth. And I would always give it with someone who had a completely opposite way of operating. You know, I was always think ahead, prepare, be prepared. And she was like, let it happen, you know, whatever came in front of you. So you should know that there are you know, many ways of attacking this problem. Um, I also use my advisor as a mentor and not just as a technical mentor. I used him as a professional mentor. So we would talk in our meetings sometimes about uh, these very same topics. How do you advise students? How do you pick problems? How do you write grants? And he'd like open his file cabinet, he'd take out a grant that was successful and he'd give it to me and I read it. So I learned how to write a grant and, and you know, things like that. Yeah, I think that's all great advice. Just yeah, remembering to be prepared, especially if you find it hard to think on your feet in public. And yeah, it's always good to remember with advisors that you can ask them things outside mm -hmm. of research questions. Um, we have uh, one more question. Okay, before, just, oh, yeah. to, just to like to have a tail end of this. Okay, so then, then I had mentors, but I passed it on. Okay, so I, I would mentor and in fact, uh, as far as I could tell, all women in academia do this, mentor women behind us in computer science. So for example, when I was chair of ASPLOS, that's another architecture conference, the first person I asked to be on my program committee was Catherine McKinley. She was maybe four or five years behind me in the, in the academic hierarchy, but it then gave her experience, um, you know, being on the program committee. So you, we, we pay back. Yeah. We yeah. don't just take. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point to, to include. Um, so we have two more questions, but I think maybe we can just end on one since we're a little over time, which is uh, what were the worst and best moments in your computer science career? Oh, the worst was by far when Intel severed the 21464. All right. The best, oh, there were so many bests. I mean, really. I learned to just enjoy so much um, mentoring and, and teaching students, you know, my, my advisees. I mean, that was a, a, an experience I hadn't had before. And, it, and to see them like grow and blossom and succeed was just like fantastic. Um, also good, uh, you know, the first time um, when I was elected to the National Academy, I think that was a big moment. You know, remember, I had, you know, did I have a, was I raised to have a career? No. I mean, I began as a secretary. So I, I had so exceeded any expectation I thought I had, you know, for myself. Um, you know, I think that, you know, that was a, that was a high point too. What was the other question, just so I know? 
Um, it was, if you have any maybe quick tips on how to prepare for elevator pitches, um, like do you keep, did you keep a document? Was it just in your head? Did you deliberately practice them or get input from others? I, yeah, I, I, was, I was at home, you know, maybe in front of the mirror, who knows? You know, I, I, would, I would devise something. Did I write them down? Mm, I, don't, I don't think I remember that, but I certainly practiced them and I knew them so well, I could roll them out on call. Perfect. Uh, you know, I, and I prepared in other ways. I mean, you go to a conference, I would think ahead of time, who, who do I want to talk at that conference? Who do I want to know about what I'm working on? Who do I, whose research do I want to know about? Who do I want to meet or who do I want to meet me? You know, I think about that ahead of time and I buttonhole them. Yeah, that's a good point, especially these days with everything on the conference websites. It's really easy to do your research ahead of time and make sure you know who's yeah. going to be there and who you want to talk to. All right. Thank you so much, Susan. Oh, you're welcome. Nice to be here. Bye-bye. Bye, Susan. Thank you. Bye.